Press room. Um, those of us interested in, in the urban are well aware of a long-standing relationship between technology and the public realm. One could argue that this interplay was evident as early as Camilo Zitte's city building according to its artistic fundamentals. Um, in the modern era, William White's study of small urban plazas via time-lapse photography stands out as a clear example of urbanists' technological focus on the public realm in order to understand how spaces work. As our technological capabilities have evolved, a new set of questions have arisen. How do we collect big data in the public realm? When do we oper operationalize it? Who benefits from it? Who pays for it? And importantly, to whom does the data belong? These questions and more will be discussed by our two guests tonight. Both are experts in spatial analytics, and while they work in different contexts, they share a commitment to making the invisible visible. We're excited to hear them describe their approaches and experiences using digital technologies in the public realm tonight. Uh, we'll have our speakers present back to back. Um, each of us will, um, each will be introduced by uh, a, one of the co-chairs. Uh, and then um, we'll have a, at the end a discussion with questions and answers. Please feel free uh, to use the chat to ask your questions at any time. We'll gather them and ask them uh, at the end. Uh, with that, I'll turn this over to Michael Keyes, co-chair of the Design Visualization Knowledge Community, who will introduce our first speaker. Michael. Thanks, Robbie. Just a just a correction. Last name Kies, I beg you, I <laughs> which is commonly mispronounced. So <laughs> no worries. So I'm one of the the co-chairs, along with Ken, of the Design Visualization Group. And uh, just to to mention this, uh, if you're new to the group, uh, not just about uh, how we show how we represent architecture in say uh, uh, a still image, but really all that is uh, the, the ability to design by, by showing what we're drawing essentially. Uh, really important, I think with the discussion tonight, the data that's being collected isn't just <clears throat> so we can have some nice graphs uh, to indicate that we're collecting it, but really to, to inform our design decisions and a part of design visualization that you might not think of conventionally when thinking about the term. So I'm excited to hear uh, from both speakers tonight, and I do get the honor of, uh, of introducing Justin Hollander. Uh, Justin's a professor of urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University. His research and teaching in the areas of physical planning, big data, shrinking cities, and the intersection between cognitive science and the design of cities. Um, I really enjoyed, especially that, that cognitive uh, aspect that you'll see tonight. He co-edited the book, Urban Experience and Design, Contemporary Perspectives on Improving the Public Realm, and is the author of seven other books on urban design and planning, including Cognitive Architecture, Designing for How We Respond to the Built Environment, and Urban Social Listening, Potential and Pitfalls for Using Microblogging Data in Studying Cities. So you'll hear some of, uh, some of the research from those books tonight. I'll put those links, by the way, in the chat if you're interested in uh, checking out those books later. And um, I should say too, that he was recently inducted as a fellow in the American Institute of Certified Planners. And as I've heard um, a couple of these firsthand, he hosts the, the Apple podcast, Cognitive Urbanism. So with that, uh, Justin, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Mike. And I really so much appreciate the chance to join this group and particularly to the urban design and visualization knowledge communities. It's really um, such an honor to be here with you all tonight. And it's really nice to, to see some friendly faces and friendly names. <laughs> Not all of you have your cameras on, which is, which is fine, but um, great, to, great to see you and looking forward to meeting some new folks this evening. Um, so yeah, so I have uh, what I hope will be a relatively short, uh, roughly 20 minute presentation and um, so the really the, the idea is um, that um, after I go and um, after Nayeli goes, then we're hoping for a very interactive, uh, rich discussion among all of us. Um, so I have a um, presentation, so I'm gonna just uh, open that up.
Okay, so mining data in the public realm. And so really, um, this is what motivates me. I really, I just want to understand when people are spending time in these public spaces, in the sidewalks, in the streets, in the plazas of the city, um, what are they thinking about? What are they feeling? You know, we spend so much time as planners, as architects, uh, shaping these spaces. Um, but what, what is it? What is it doing? Is it working? Is it not working? Um, and so we actually have uh, historically uh, have different different ways of kind of measuring how good a job um, we're, we're doing in creating this public realm and shaping it. Um, so we have various types of surveys we can administer. You can look at economic or fiscal impacts, um, behavioral, you know, various ways of, of kind of asking people about how they act. Um, but now we have data mining. We have uh, really uh, ridiculous sources of new insight into what is actually happening in these public realms, how are people using them, and what are they thinking about? What do they care about? Um, so first of all, there's biometrics. No, of course, biometrics have been around. We've been measuring people's heart rates for, for half a century, if not more, um, through, through different types of tools. Um, but we now have uh, portable biometrics. We have very inexpensive biometrics that don't have to be uh, to restricted to the use of, of, of health researchers or, or medical doctors. We can use that in our fields. Social media data, uh, the, there's so much social media data that is, is locked up, but actually quite a lot is, is really available and accessible to anyone doing any kind of planning and design. Um, and I'll talk about how I've done that. Um, and the last one is Google Street View. The street, street View is really, in many ways, one of the most extraordinary accomplishments of human civilization. <laughs> um, you know, Google driving their cars and other vehicles up and down um, just about every street in the in Western society and and most of the rest of the world. Actually, it's really amazing the coverage they have, and, and we have we have these photos and. So what I want to do is talk about these uh, three areas, and I have a few research projects I'm going to kind of summarize really quickly in each one, really just to kind of give you a sense of, of some of my work in this area um, with the hope of, of spurring what I hope will be a rich conversation about, about these questions about how, how do we access and use these data. Okay, so first of all, biometrics kind of sounds a little scary, right? Um, it's really the idea of trying to capture that unconscious. It's one thing if you ask someone, how are you feeling? It's another if you hook them up to a machine and you read their vital signs um, or you connect them with um, an eye tracker to see where they're looking at. And that's what we're talking about here. And, and Freud was very aware of that and modern psychology um, sees that actually it's even more than 14%. Uh, it, it's, it's closer to 90% of our experience with um, the world around us is, is operating on that unconscious level. Um, and so, so we're not really aware of what's happening. So how do we capture that? Well, one way, which I'm going to talk about, is eye tracking software that allows us to kind of predict and respond to what is happening in the environment. Um, so this is what um, an eye tracking lab setup looks like. Um, all that equipment is about $300. So we're not talking about um, anything that's going to blow anyone's budget. Um, and here there's a, at the top, there's a camera and the bottom there's a camera. And then this is really just a training the system. So it just recognizes where your eye is going. Um, this whole apparatus can be squeezed into a, um, glasses that you can wear, mobile eyeglasses. And I did a research project with, with this recently. Now those glasses are a little more expensive. That, that pair of glasses uh, cost $20,000, um, but you can use these kinds of equipment, um, much, much less expensive. Um, so what it does is it maps the path of the eye and it helps us understand that, that part of the iceberg below the surface. It helps us understand what people are thinking, what, 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 what kind of behaviors they're intending to have, um, what, what they're feeling when they're in the, in the public realm. Now I've also used this other software uh, that 3M makes, which they're actually gonna be um, putting it, baking it into Adobe Adobe Acrobat. So um, it'll be uh, even easier to use, but it, it, what it does is it uses all of this eye tracking research to be able to um, approximate what a person might look at in those first three to five seconds 
uh, when they see a scene. And I'm sorry, I keep getting darker, but you're probably looking at the PowerPoint anyway. Um, so, so, it, so we can really uh, improve our, our designs because you can use this kind of approach to test different scenarios and, and see these, these hidden, hidden um, uh, responses that people have. Now, uh, I'm about to just show you some examples where, where I've done it. I've used this, this technology, um, but one of the ones uh, is really exciting about trying to understand how walkability can be impacted. But let me just, 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 uh, just show you what it looks like. Um, so here uh, is the subject looking at the Stapleton Library in New York City. So you can just kind of watch how our eyes track out where um, uh, uh, this, this gaze path on the image. And then what we did is we photoshopped out the windows. And this gentleman, you see what he's looking at. So we did this with uh, 30 people looked at the version with the windows and then 30 people looked at it without the windows. And this was the, the summary. So clearly something's going on here. Um, by creating these blank facades on the left or the right, it really forced the people to look at that center. You're really no longer kind of taking in the whole building. Um, so, so there's something that's really relevant here is, as we think about what kind of a public realm we're creating, where are people, where are we drawing people's eyes? And this notion, uh, it's just uh, abbreviated there, TTFF, time to first fixation. How long does it take when someone's looking, do they first focus they, that, that idea of a fixation? Um, and so to be able to measure that, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless for us in our quest to be able to um, understand what's happening in, pub in the public realm. Um, so in this uh, slide, I'm showing you an example of this research I did in, uh, in Devons. And we saw that the um, walk, you can really see walkability because in the upper uh, image, which was designed um, as a um, walkable kind of new urbanist style um, neighborhood, the gaze path shows you you're walking along that chance street there and people are engaged with the, um, the street wall um, as you're walking along. Um, and here in the back, the back alley, which was designed for cars and was not designed for people to be walking, you're all disoriented. You don't know where to look. Look at look at how much your gaze path is is affected. Um, and then here's just an, another another uh, illustration, which you just see how much uh, the person kind of takes in columns. They take in flags. I mean, how long have architects been paying attention to flags and columns? Well, now we have the empirical evidence. There's a good reason that flags and columns, um, in contrast, work. It's because that's what you see on an unconscious level. Um, so you can combine this eye tracking with um, different types of other biometrics, facial expression, where you can kind of monitor whether or not someone's unconsciously smiling or not, heart rate I mentioned. Um, and then this little uh, icon, I collaborate on this research with Ann Sussman and um, she insists that we always keep these in our slides. Um, the, the companies that do this, iMotions is one, they, they work for Honda, they work for BMW, GM, um, because the car companies know you have to use this, um, but, so far, architecture and planning, we haven't quite been so fast to, to catch on. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about my second area. Uh, we're talking about trying to understand what's happening in the built environment. Well, what about trying to capture social media activity? Well, Twitter has 300 million active users and microblogging, you know, posting on, on that, that um, service, it, it allows people to just talk about what they care about. You're not like sitting down with someone and having a survey and saying, what, uh, what is your favorite part of this plaza? You, you just look to see where do they spend their time when they're posting or what are they, when they post, what part of the plaza do they talk about or they take a picture. Um, and then so you can use sentiment analysis also to do that. Um, so we wrote some software to try to like access, access some of this data. We did this test in Newark and all you have to do with Twitter, it's actually not rocket science. You, you just type in the Northeast latitude and longitude, and then the Southwest longitude and latitude. And then it just takes in all the Twitter posts that people are posting. This is what it looks like. Um, I know this type is a little small, but I mean, you're getting the username, you get unique ID, you're getting the text, and of course you're getting the latitude and longitude. People are, are making this available um, uh, freely. 
Um, so the sentiment analysis uses the, this kind of a system. It's a uh, it's a sentiment dictionary. So so that all the words are pre-coded on a valence from negative five to positive five. So it allows you to quickly, easily get a sense of what kind of tone people are using. And this is a project I did with the city of New York, Department of Design and Construction. And they were interested in, in how some of their projects might be impacting the conversation on Twitter. And you can see that there's actually quite a lot of variation across the different um, sentiments of different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, so I wrote about this in, in this book, Urban Social Listening, um, which Mike mentioned earlier. Um, so the last area is uh, Google Street View. Um, and so it's really about seeing what kind of insights we can get around those sem semi-regular images that Google is, is not only collecting, but are but they're sharing on this on the API. API is uh, just a way that you can easily um, access um, uh, any kind of uh, computer system. So so there's um, a stream that comes. So I did this project with the government of government of Quebec, and we were comparing Montreal and, and Toronto. We um, used the data set that some researchers at MIT developed, where they showed people two images in the Boston area and they asked which which image looks safer. And so by surveying actual humans and asking them which looks safer, that we then use that and programmed a convolutional neural network to be able to help the machine understand what a human would think is safe or not. So this, this idea of computer vision, it allows us to understand at this extraordinary scale. I mean, it was like, so 20,000 images in Toronto, almost 30,000 in Montreal. Um, just like that, we can, we can go basically almost any point in the city and, decide, and, and know, is this place a place that someone might think is safe or not? And once you've, once you've built that, that model, I mean, you can do that almost any, any uh, part of the planet Earth. Anywhere there's a street view images. Um, so this was the uh, output when we did it. Um, so you see, these are all places at Montreal that the computer thought was unsafe. And these are all places that it thought was safe. And you can definitely see there's a lot of green in these places. Um, but this is all the biases that were you know, in, in, calculated and um, in, in inputted into it, the model based on the, the human biases towards whether towards green space or narrow side, narrow roads. I, I'm not sure because you can't ask the computer. It's, it doesn't really go like that. You just, it's kind of a black box. Um, so this is what it looks like. And so you can do this for um, any, basically any part of the planet where there's uh, street view images which is pretty much blankets the entire United States. And so the yellow is uh, places that the computer thought would be uh, PR is safe. And then the, the black hash marks were unsafe. The same thing. Um, so yeah, then we looked at um, some of the planning that was going on in each of those cities and then mapped the density of the planning and what you see overlaying um, this is the, uh, in the Toronto example, um, what you see is uh, there seems to be actually some sort of relationship. Some of the um, areas where there's the most planning activity is the areas where people judge it as, as unsafe. And it's a little bit more, actually more compelling in Montreal. And we did do some statistics and, and we were able to establish that there was a relationship between the where the planning is happening and, and where are the places that are considered unsafe. So <laughs> lightning speed, um, you hopefully this gives you some food for thought and thinking about kind of the larger questions of what we're trying to accomplish here tonight. And um, I hope, um, uh, look forward to Nayeli's presentation. I hope uh, you guys have lots of questions after that. Great, thank you, Justin. Really, in, really fascinating. I, I, I am curious a little bit, and I'll ask you a question later about um, uh, whether you can walk through some of those street views 
and do the eye tracking at the same time, and you, if that's a little more dynamic. But we can talk about that in a minute. So thanks so much. That was great. Our next speaker um, is Nayeli Rodriguez, and she works for the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics as Boston's technologist for the public realm. As an urban planner with a background in creative technology and journalism, she previously worked at Sasaki and managed creative projects for Google. Nayeli is interested in how changes in technology and the environment will affect how we design and use public space. She draws on her interdisciplinary experience to navigate current generational challenges, such as digital equity, automation, climate change, data privacy, resilience, and environmental justice. Nayeli's work for the city of Boston aims to meaningfully and equitably integrate technology into Boston's parks, streets, waterfronts, sidewalks, and other shared places. So thank you, Nayeli, for joining us. And she will make her presentation now. Thank you so much, Martin. Sure. Um, and thanks for inviting me to join this uh, conversation, which I'm already super excited to um, chat afterwards. But first, I can talk to you a little bit about um, how making the vi invisible visible um, and data visualization comes into play in the work that I do, just slightly different from um, Justin. Um, so I work for the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, which is the city's civic R&D team, and we prototype and experiment with different approaches that try to improve the quality of life for Boston residents and visitors in partnership with city departments, academic institutions, and community members. And on that team, as Martin mentioned, I'm the technologist for the public realm, and we take a pretty broad approach to um, interpreting what that word technologist means. So technology in, in our team means anything from um, digital equity, data privacy issues, um, support for new technology pilots, but also non-digital technology like novel approaches to installing green infrastructure or offsetting urban heat island effect. Um, most of all, we try to lead with an approach that uses technology um, with keeping humans and people at the center of the conversation and builds trust to enable civic action um, try not to be too creepy in the way that we deploy technology and uh, support resilient communities. So in this line of work, um, also especially leading a lot of these conversations uh, from the perspective of the city, we get a lot of really big questions. Um, some of the most common ones that I tend to get are, are how are we collecting data without surveilling residents? Is that even possible? Can data and technology be used to build trust instead of erode it? Uh, when and for whom does data collection actually lead to action? Um, and when? what is the future of civic life and public engagement in the digital age? For a lot of reasons, people really tend to focus on that last one, uh, especially you know in COVID with us all spending so much time immersed in digital technology. So I'm gonna try to get at a couple of answers, certainly not definitive answers with a few projects that we've done in Boston um, and, and how we're trying to answer some of these questions. So. That first question about how we can collect data without surveilling residents. My answer to that is it's totally possible. Just try not to be creepy when you do it. Uh, today, um, a lot of uh, you know data that's collected for transportation and planning purposes is generated either manually or through camera footage that can involve storing a lot of visually identifiable images of faces and license plates. And then once collected, that information um, is often proprietary and users like city planners have to pay regular fees to access it and it hardly ever becomes public. So we recently did a project um, with these sensors called Numina sensors, which use computer vision instead of cameras to collect data on um, the movement of pedestrians, cars, trucks, uh, bikes uh, in the public realm, their paths and movement and also counts. And the difference between computer vision um, and camera work, you can see here in the green, you see what the data is that is actually reported. So you can see a box around a human and its path of movement. But um, you know, in the background, you see what a camera would see, which is like all of the rich details of the um, people's faces and potentially license plates. And that's what we don't want to collect. We talk a lot about right sizing with, and, and this project was really about right sizing our data collection to try to just gather the minimum amount of data for the task. Um, and this was interestingly timed with the rollout of um, the city's Healthy Streets program, which was aimed at providing more space for people to bike and walk around in the context of COVID, but it led to this conversation about what is healthy. For a lot of communities in Boston, collecting too much data 
um, on them, especially when it includes faces and license plates, that's actually making the space not healthy and not safe for them. So with this project, we wanted to know, um, was it possible to gather useful, usable data on street level activity using sensors that are lightweight, require a minimal power supply, and most importantly, did not contribute to the surveillance of residents. So we deployed um, three sensors in three different street scenarios, one um, in the seaport, one right downtown on Tremont and Boylston, and then one in um, Jackson Square in Jamaica Plain. And this project's data set generated, um, uh, or what was, was generated without the collection or storage of sensitive images, and eventually it'll be freely available to the public for download in multiple formats. Um, and the data itself looks kind of like this. Um, this what we could see the overall volume of different pedestrians and bike bicyclists and cars um, for, for the city and then for each individual sensor. And if we clicked on an individual sensor, um, so this is a period in July, you could see the paths of movement for each different type of user. So you could see that you know, pedestrians um, and cyclists actually tend to go on the sidewalk and in the bike lane and then obviously cars, trucks and buses in the street. And it was actually quite an interactive platform. Um, you could see, you know, um, for that specific sensor, when were the different peaks at different times of day? Um, you could change your view to be um, for the day or for the entire week or the entire data collection period, which was super useful for our planners um, if they were trying to, you know, change something small about the public realm or the physical makeup of the space and then see if that impacted uh, the volumes of pedestrians or cyclists and cars. In this case, in Jackson Square, I think they were really focused on um, safety uh, for pedestrians crossing. So they could see really clearly in this heat map um, where pedestrians and cyclists were most likely to come in contact with cars. Um, and you could draw little zones of study and study like a, an area even more. And this entire public platform, obviously you can, I think a lot of designers on the call would be able to understand how this is really helpful for design. But it could also be really helpful for different community organizers or academics in their advocacy and research. And that's why a really big goal of this project was to partner with a vendor who would allow us to make all of this rich data available to the public and not be proprietary and kind of like locked behind um, a paywall. So um, in this data, you can see a lot of different trends about, you know, the, the reopening of Boston, this, you know, um, the reopening of public places. Um, you can see, you know, different protest movements that happened this summer in certain areas. It's super interesting and we're hoping everybody's going to get a chance to explore it soon. Overall, I would say that we learned that it is possible to collect minimum viable data for a planning task like this. It does not impact the success of the planning or st um, study. Um, you can make the data more transparent and trustworthy using um, signals to the public that data collection is taking place. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, next. And um, also that it's super important to make um, the data public because when people know what data you're collecting, they tend to trust not only the data collection, but also the outcomes. And that was a feedback that we got. So that was super interesting to take in mind. So moving on, this next question about can data and technology be used to build trust? Um, I say to that also, yes. Um, and uh, transparency is, more, uh, or is less important than accountability in this case. We're trying to move from just being transparent about the data that we collect um, to being accountable for the data that we collect um, and try to have the public hold us accountable for the data that we collect as well. Um, this gets back to a couple of really original Monum themes. So Monum has been around for 10 years. I've only been with the team for almost two years. Um, so this is a project that predates me as sort of the OG civic data collection project um, for the 311 app that the city uses to address incoming 311 requests. Um, and over time that was developed from just being like kind of a call based system to various apps um, and uh, you know, different like um, iterations of the 311 system overall. And a big goal of that project when um, they moved to the newest version of the app was, can you build trust through transparency? So if by collecting this information and then sharing um, information about the individual jobs that were addressed through 311 with residents, does that actually help them to trust government more? Um, in, that, in the case of that project, I think it was a resounding success. Again, it predates me, but it's one of Monum's um, kind of like OG successes that we love to talk about. So when I came to the team, um, this was already a theme, but we wanted to take it further um, and kind of address the situation that when you move from the app to the physical built environment, there's this fundamental problem that all that digital information is really invisible. Um, you can uh, imagine that when you're like walking down a street, um, you 
could encounter CCTVs, traffic cameras, transit card readers, bike lane counters, Wi-Fi access points, a lot of different technology, potentially even on the same block, but there's very little transparency about what's being collected and we wanted to address that. So the DTPR, which stands for Digital Transparency in the Public Realm Signage System, was trying to get people to quickly understand how those technologies work, the purposes that they serve um, in a consistent um, and replicable way, the same way that you can go through any airport and you would understand you know, where to go for, for, for customs or to get your bags. Um, so, you know, we wanted to make this system something that could not only work in Boston, that, but that, that could work anywhere and hopefully share it with other cities as well. Um, so we, you know, in partnership with um, a group called Helpful Places, developed um, this common visual language um, that would address not only the purpose, but also the type of technology being used, whether or not it was sensitive or, you know, more anonymized data, and then who was accountable for that data collection that was happening and help people move again from just being transparent about the data that's happening to actually giving them a point of connection to the um, agency or the planning body that is using that data so that they can follow up on it if they choose to do that. So DTPR is this open source communication standard for transparency and accountability around technology in public space. The way that it works is that we deploy the signage um, usually temporarily uh, because a lot of our data collection is temporary. Um, so we deploy the signage adjacent to where the data collection is taking place. There's a QR code that's connected to a digital interface. And then when you scan the QR code, a mobile app opens on the phone, um, which contains more information and super detailed information about all of the ways that the data is accessible, its privacy settings, um, really everything that you could want to know and how to follow up and a little survey about how the technology makes the user feel, which we were super interested in understanding more of. Um, so if you're biking around or walking around Boston, you might see these little signage um, and we'd be cur super curious to hear what you think about them. We're hoping to roll that out into a larger scale pilot this summer. So that brings us to the question of when does data collection lead to action? So if we've given all these avenues to people to follow up on, um, you know, how can they actually follow up on all this data collection that's taking place? And here I would say we've learned a lot of lessons about how just because you can measure or visualize data doesn't necessarily mean that you can operationalize data. Um, either because there are operational challenges, which we will talk about a little bit, or because not everybody who has access to data necessarily feels empowered to take action. Just because you know something is happening or know something is true doesn't necessarily mean that you are in a position to make a change or advocate for yourself. And we have learned that lesson many times, I think. Um, one of the ways that we learned this lesson, this is again a project that predates me, but it's legacy um lives on in boston um and that's why i get to still talk about it, even though i wasn't involved in its rollout and that's the big valley trash can project which you know this was a public private partnership with this company that said you know we're going to deploy these solar um, powered big trash cans and recycling bins around the city and then we can tell you the minute that a trash can reach, reaches capacity a recycling bin um, is overflowing and then you can quickly reroute your um you know your maintenance crews to empty it and that way we'll never have overflowing trash cans um which is a great idea in theory but operationalizing that data set um you know even though you could you could get this very rich map showing you know exactly the capacities of um all of the 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 cans all over the city we we, we couldn't really operationalize that because that's not the way that maintenance crews are routed they are part of a union and that comes with specific um you know constraints on their time and the way that they you know plan their work, um, rightly so. And it also just doesn't make sense to um, empty trash cans um, the minute that they um, become full when you might have several almost full trash cans like in one neighborhood and you need to plan work in the most efficient um, way. Additionally, this goes back to some of the themes that we addressed with the 311 app, which is, you know, some neighborhoods um, may be inequitably served and the data collection doesn't necessarily tell you that if it's just telling you where there's trash it doesn't necessarily tell you that there's been historic disinvestment in the neighborhood and we should probably you know try to address that in the way that we plan um, our maintenance routes so um i think this leads to this this conversation that i'm often having with people about data and data collection and visualization which is you know you can use data and data visualization to make these large-scale engineering design and planning decisions um, or you can use data to tell a story and in, inspire more personal actions. 
Um, and that's what this next project is about. So this is a project that's currently in very, very early stages, which is why you can see it's sort of sketched out here. But we had this idea of um, creating uh, what we call a lunchbox of sensors. This would be a take home kit that residents can check out of the library or through their children's classroom. Um, that would include a series of sensors that can tell them about um, things like air quality, humidity, temperature, noise, light, and other environmental conditions in their home. And we think that this is important because the instrumentation of state uh, space, you know, everywhere from public space to private homes with different sensors, you know, is, is everywhere now, but there's very few success stories about how that data actually leads to widespread action, especially in the area of climate change. Um, and so I think that we were really looking for a way to link data collection, especially around environmental conditions, to um, action around climate resilience, public health outcomes, um, and what individual people can do to um, mitigate the uh, risks that they may, may be experiencing in their own home. So um, this is actually what the technology that I, I you know, looks like. Um, the, the, the sketch was more of a, um, a concept of how the whole program will work, but we're evaluating a couple of different forms of technology um, that can provide us with this information that'll be kind of like take home for different residents. It all leads to um, a map where people um, who submit their data, you know, the, you take the sensor home from the library, set it up in your house, let it run for a week or two. It contributes to a data set that you can see um, in a public dashboard and then get a bunch of information about um, all the various, the various environmental factors that you observe in your home. This again gets back to this concept of linking um, public health uh, to education programs around climate and also digital literacy as like a key component to community resiliency, which we really believe in. It's not enough just to know about climate change, but all the ways that climate change is being addressed and planned for at the city are really data reliant. And in order to, people, to bring people along in that planning journey with us, we need to get them to understand the data sets that we're looking at. So here you can see, we're comparing humidity with NO2. Um, here we're comparing noise and air temperature. I think this is really funny because as air temperature um, goes up, so does noise. And that was something that we observed with fireworks last year, um, which believe it or not actually was a public health concern. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to, you know, empower people with this type of data so that they can become better advocates with themselves as well and really say, you know, the noise is getting to be an unhealthy level in my neighborhood. I really need help addressing this or um, messaging to my neighbors about why this is a problem. We also have um, different programs that let residents have, for example, a public health official come to their home and assess whether or not they need help addressing mold because asthma is a really big issue or whether they need to be prescribed um, a fan because their apartment is too hot um, and you know in times of extreme heat they're going to be facing a health risk. So look out for that program coming hopefully to a BPL near you. Um, so moving from personal action to kind of collective action around climate outcomes, this is a project that our team was involved in, although it was run out of the Museum of Science called Wicked Hot Boston, where different residents rode around and collected temperature data all across the city and they contributed to what's one of the most comprehensive land surface temperature surveys for the area. It's super useful for planning. We still use it today. Um, and I think this is a great example of how, you know, the resident collected data um, really helps tell a story and helps empower action. You know, once those residents participated in that data collection, like they're never gonna forget the hot places that they helped to record and contribute to that data set. Um, and that really helps us make that cultural shift, not only around climate change, but also around data awareness and the role that data plays in our lives. So moving on to this last um, question about the future of civic life and engagement in the digital age. And here, I think um, we really try to advocate for this you know, cultural shift around data um, where our goals are really to enable deeper resident participation in local government and empower residents to make decisions through greater access to information and position them not just as the creators or data points, but actual conscientious and engaged consumers of data as well. Um, so a couple ways that we're, we're doing that um, is investing in digital equity. So digital equity you know, has been an issue in many cities, including Boston for a long time that was only exacerbated by the COVID crisis. Um, and so while Boston is trying to, you know, take that um, head on and invest in different um, educational programs and community 
outreach um, to you know increase digital equity across the city. Um, we, we realize that we can always be doing more. And we realize also that it's our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of individual residents to understand every way that we're using data. It's our responsibility to promote this cultural shift in awareness around technology, data, and all the related challenges. And that's the only way that we're gonna have like true trust and engagement from Bostonians, which is really functional to um, not only every successful data collection initiative, but also you know, just the functional, functional democracy. Um, so we're also trying to explore new tools for civic participation in the data age. Um, on the left here, you'll see this digital defense playbook, which was created by community organizers, I believe in Los Angeles, um, but we're evaluating whether or not something like that might be useful for community groups in Boston um, to help them understand all the ways that data can and is impacting their lives. Um, and data collection. And then on the right, you see um, an app that uh, before COVID, I was very interested in using. Maybe it'll make a, a resurgence once we get back to normal, but that actually helps um, individual users when they're in a public space that they care about to help um, count the people who are there, you know, log a little bit of a message about what they're doing, um, and then over time contribute to this body of data. Um, that can let people know when it's time to make a decision about that space, you know, what people who spend a lot of time day to day actually observe instead of just um, the people who come in when it's time to plan or design something new in that space. And the very last thing that I'll mention um, is that, you know, with all of these projects, we're really trying to make a shift from, you know, the digital world and the physical world as two separate things to, you know, enmeshing those two things and trying to draw attention to all of these invisible, you know, um, data collection efforts and technology um, through the way that we design and plan the public realm. So soon, um, also coming to a BPL near you will be um, more activation around a project that we started last summer, which was deploying outdoor Wi-Fi in the areas around BPL. So a lot of people in Boston rely on the BPL to access the internet. Obviously in COVID that wasn't possible. That really highlighted something that was already an issue, which is again, this, this question of digital equity. So we're looking into ways this summer and you may see um, a notice coming from um, the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics soon looking for community partners and help in designing the outdoor Wi-Fi zones that will draw attention and provide further resources um, to people who access the Wi-Fi at the BPL outdoors and trying to think about what the future of those spaces might be and what else people would need beside Wi-Fi when we're thinking about a public realm of the future that supports the needs that we have today. And that's it. Well, thank you both so much. There was a lot to take in. Um, we don't have a huge number of questions in, in the chat yet, I imagine because everyone was just absorbing and there was certainly a lot not, not to absorb um, from both of you. So thank you so much. Um, so I don't know whether either of you have questions uh, for one another or any of the knowledge, uh, knowledge community chairs um, have questions to kind of kick things off. Um, I. Uh, can start potentially with a, um, a, a question for, for Justin, myself. Um, so I, I thought some of the research that you were doing on kind of the gaze path um, and kind of un unconscious kind of gaze analysis um, is super interesting. Uh, I'd seen something like that from, from Supernormal. I know they were doing some kind of analysis on how people look at, at buildings and kind of where, where people's eyes go. So I guess two questions on that. First is, I don't know if you've looked at all with virtual reality. I know there's a lot happening with gaze tracking in virtual reality to kind of understand um, how people um, process design. Um, and then, yeah, I guess related to that, um, you know, are people using that at all to kind of um, uh, look at the things that are not built yet, things that are still kind of in the early stages, just in the digital model kind of phase? Or are there any studies around how you can actually use that as another way to look at design while you're still kind of designing it? Um, yeah, well, th thanks so much, Ken, for the questions. I mean, I, uh, first of all, the, you're right, though, in, virtual, in a virtual reality environment, um, you can and people have studied the uh, eye tracking. Um, and so that, you know, that can be a really great way to be able to avoid, you know, I mean, if you're in a real life environment, things like a ambulance driving by, you know, is going to distract 
a, you know, a dog on the street, right? <laughs> so, so by having that virtual reality, you can really control all of those variables and, um, you know, really get a you know, better sense of what people are experiencing. Um, so yeah, so there, there's definitely examples out there. It's, uh, it's pretty expensive though, um, because you basically have to create like a, a that kind of environment. Um, and then you have to put, put someone in that, uh, in that equipment. So um, it's not as practical for kind of like a typical designer who's kind of just wants to sketch out a few designs and see, and see uh, what, how people might respond. But certainly uh, for a really big project, um, this would, that would be a good investment. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the other question, I think um, that this is being used in practice, um, not a lot from what I've seen. I have a colleague, Don Ruggles, and he has a practice um, in um, uh, Colorado, and you know he's starting to use this as as to inform his design process, and so I know others others are. So it's really we're kind of at an exciting time, I think. That's great. Just just I don't want to dwell on that too much, but just while you know other folks formulate questions, how how, how do you know? I mean, you you've shown some of the examples, things that are better and worse, um, but are there ways of actually um, measuring that, like actually saying? Um, because you know you can see it, I guess, <laughs> but it still takes interpretation from from somebody looking at it. Yeah, so so a little interpretation is is really critical. I mean, what I think is um, really important in this science is that when you imagine you find yourself in Copley Square, it's all happening unconsciously, but you do fixate on something. So that first thing that you fixate on, that first thing you look at that is going into long-term memory. You're gonna remember that. So, so you're gonna connect with that place, mm -hmm. that building, that facade, that statue, whatever it's gonna be. Um, and, and I mean, so to the extent that you're fixating, you're making those, those unconscious connections between your eye and some object or some building, um, and that, that's how we remember. And that's like a, a critical to, to thinking about um, what, what we're trying to accomplish in terms of uh, creating places that are lasting and that that people want to preserve <laughs> in the future. I have a question for Justin about the eye tracking. Um, I, I think it's super interesting and I'm actually familiar with the MIT data set that you shared. Um, I think they came and gave us a presentation to our planning team not so long ago. And there was, of course, you know, predictably, I think a, a big question about where the training data set was coming from mm -hmm. and, you know, whose eyes would necessarily be drawn to a green space versus another type of space mm -hmm. and perceive that as safe or unsafe. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to address that or if you have any experiments or conversations planned to try and, and get at that question. Yeah, and, and you know, I really emphasize how if you can use that training data set and you can really figure it out, then you could apply that elsewhere. But you have to be careful because as, as you talked about, there are different perceptions. And so, so I think um, the answer is that the way that people perceive something like safety is, is very subjective. Um, so I've actually been doing this project where we're looking at another, um, construct, uh, we're looking at beauty. And so, you know, in many ways, people will argue that beauty is very subjective, but, you know, not everyone thinks that. This gentleman I just mentioned, Don Ruckles, he wrote a whole, whole book about this, and there's now a movie on the same subject about um, the very kind of objective nature of beauty. And this is something that that uh, we've really um, known in the architecture world for a long time. And it's, it's there is something uh, that that is objectively beautiful. And it, it has to do with how we perceive of something and how it affects our, our body on an unconscious level. And that's not culturally sensitive, but something like, like uh, safety is very culturally sensitive. Um, tall grasses is, is gonna be something that's gonna um, make someone from uh, Asia maybe more sensitive because they might be worried about snakes. And that's not something that we worry about as much here. So. So there's no question that the answer is to um, to calibrate those kinds of models to local, local oh wow <laughs> local preferences. Um, so. I would be really curious if you were able to use that um, same technology to perceive whether or not a place is 
experienced as more or less safe based on whether or not there's a police camera present. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, so that's going to operate not at so much an unconscious level, but consciously. Do you recognize it? Do you see it? Do you, do you see the insignia of the Boston Police Department? Right. So that that's a, that's an empirical question. You could really you could do those surveys and, and look at how people respond. Yeah. Justin, I, so we, I go ahead, Rami. Sorry, I I, I um, had with, just a thought when you were sort of the last thing you you spoke about was sort of you were implying a correlation between perceived safety and the amount of planning that that an area had received. You didn't come out and say it, and I'm I'm wondering <laughs> if, if there's something there you would like to say, and and if there's another way to think about that as well that uh, so the, the the inference i'm i'm assuming is that you know the places with the most planning are also the ones that people are considering most unsafe right and you can take that what, what does that mean and I, I wonder if the places that receive the most planning are also the or public planning are also the ones that tend to be um you know uh you know, the wealthier parts of town, they don't want or need or ask for uh, public planning, right? So in other words, it, it might not be the planning that's making these places unsafe, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's the, the poverty, uh, you know, or relative poverty and, and uh, other social issues that are attracting both the planning and the perceptions of, of um, lack of safety. Wow, Rami. I mean, I was going through the slides like uh, two seconds each, and I was uh, impressed that you picked that up. That's, you're right. I mean, I, we don't know. I mean, as researchers, like we don't know. We did not design the study to be able to establish causation. That would have been a much more elaborate endeavor. But yeah, there's there's definitely something interesting going on, and and um, and I think I'm gonna agree. I'm gonna agree with you that that. It may, that may be the fact that maybe what's going on that it's it's because of the those people living there that that's um God. If, if i could if i could build on <laughs> it uh i think this this notion of correlation and inference is really huge when you consider data when you consider experimentation and what what struck me is uh when nayeli had mentioned uh, this correlation between air temperature and noise level and, and my mind was just spinning. Like, does that mean in the summertime windows are open? You know, people are louder. In the wintertime, heat is on, windows are closed, less people on the street. I was just trying to correlate those things and try to make some sense of it as a designer mm -hmm. of an urban, in the urban realm. What, you know, what does that mean? What, how does that, is that an objective thing that is, can be applied to every neighborhood or is it you know, very specific? How did, how did you read that, Nayeli? I'm curious. Um, yeah, that was one of the, so really interestingly with that, that platform that that um, technology provider offers is that you can compare. So all of the different environmental conditions that are being um, measured by the sensor, you can then select to and compare them, which is super interesting. And it, it was one of the reasons why we felt like that was the right thing, because we wanted people to make those exact same observations and say, wait a second, like, why is air temperature? Why, why when it gets hotter, does it also get louder? I think that you're um, thought about windows being open since it is an indoor sensor um, is definitely on the right track. I mean, I, I have no way of, of knowing necessarily because, you know, we don't, we, we just see the data, right? And this is, I think, pointing to like a very big question or a, a theme in all of this, which is that you can see data. You, we all bring our own biases or our own like conclusions to reading that data. But I mean, we don't quantitatively know why it gets louder in the summertime. There's lots of likely reasons fireworks was a big one. Um, so we're definitely looking into that data set because there were so many complaints about fireworks last year. And while I think some people think that it's funny, there's actually a lot of like trauma and PTSD um, among seniors and among veterans um, having to do with fireworks. So super interesting to know, like, you know, if we could measure on average when noise levels start to increase and time of day, we could potentially, you know, do some messaging or have some sort of response to that from a policy or planning perspective. Mm -hmm. I think people on the street, obviously, like there's just more um, reason to go outside when it's nicer out. 
and people mm -hmm. probably take advantage of that. I, I wonder also um, if in the summertime um, people entertain, I guess, I'm just wondering like what are the, what's the nature of home life and how does that change seasonally? And if COVID mm -hmm. shifted that at, at all, mm -hmm. right. um, if it's harder to like get out of the house in the winter time, so people have fewer people over, I don't know. I had lots of thoughts um, about that. Mm -hmm. I think there's potentially also a certain amount of animal noise, like birds um, come back in the summertime as it gets warmer. Mm -hmm. uh, would love to like dig into that or have a researcher dig into that more. Mm -hmm. You could come up with a million stories. Yeah. Dogs barking. Yep. <laughs> we hear that on Zoom all the time. Yeah. What's super interesting to compare that, that data set with, in my mind uh, as well, um, is that obviously, you know, the police department has um, different microphone, uh, like enabled technology that gathers data, you know, or is, is trained to hear a gunshot or what they, they, they believe to be a gunshot um, in neighborhoods. And then have that trigger, you know, either a response or, um, you know, often it'll trigger uh, the recording or flagging of a certain um, like camera. And I think that's a super interesting type of noise data to compare with this ambient noise in the household. And I would be super interested if somebody was able to um, get access to like an anonymized um, version of both of those data sets, how you could correlate them and see if there was any relationship between like the gunshot analysis um, and noise and also the air temperature um, and also the at home noise levels. Mm -hmm. So we, we have one, one question in the, in the chat from Ben. Um, ben, I see you're un unmuted. Would uh, you happy to, to ask it yourself? Hey, Ken. Hey, We're on to you. Sorry. Um, so the question was really just how to address the digital divide in planning projects, particularly those that are really uh, pushing forward um, how we use data and making sure that we're reaching communities and using the data in appropriate ways uh, when, uh, when we're rolling out these kind of really cutting edge uh, projects. So question for either panelists, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. I am very skeptical of most like new trial data driven, like our data collection um, approaches because I feel like you have to prove that you can reach a community before you introduce like a new way to reach a community. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, some, some communities haven't been reached or don't have um, a voice in the planning process because they haven't been reached out to um, or haven't been reached out to in the right way. I don't think that that's always a function that data or technology can solve. I think that's a, a human problem that data sometimes suggests it can solve, but really it comes back to the way that people interact with other people and data is only going to, um, I guess, exacerbate whatever existing um, you know, disinvestment or neglect already exists because it bring, pushes people farther apart rather than bringing them together and encouraging them to interact directly. Um, that being said, I agree that a lot of times data sets can highlight where inequities exist in a way that becomes quite stark and unavoidable. Um, yeah, I don't have a good uh, necessarily answer about how we consistently balance those two things. And I think that actually is kind of the point. Like you have to look at each situation new and not just expect that there's a common data approach for every new planning project because there's not. And every data approach doesn't work for every community or for every planning process. Like, I think we need to move away from this idea that, okay, this tool is really great and it'll always work. Mm -hmm. There's actually a, a great question uh, from, from Aaron related to that, I'll just read. Uh, so for communities that have been historically disinvested and there's a great benefit that can come from some of these sorts of trial data di driven projects. However, there's also a great risk of failure with these new ideas, which can make the situations worse and increase distrust. So how do you balance those considerations? Well, I did a project in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, uh, community that's that's experienced a, a lot of disinvestment and and the people that live there are very untrustworthy um, about uh, the the ability of local government to to be interested in their 
their needs. And so what we did was that kind of social listening approach that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, we were interested in the kind of the goal of the project was to, to, to try to find a new way to identify properties that could be eligible for potentially historic listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and typically that's done by a bunch of people who are in the local historic society, um, but we wanted to kind of bring it out to the people. And so instead of like writing a letter to everyone or, <laughs> or sending them an email or setting up a website at the, on the library, we, we just looked to see, well, where are people spending time in Holyoke? Um, where are they congregating? Where are they talking about spending time? Uh, where are they taking pictures? Um, you know, various types of websites we use, Flickr. Um, and so through that kind of inductive approach, we were able to get a really good idea of the places that actually mattered to the people of Holyoke. Um, but as Nayeli kind of emphasized, like it's not like there's one, one solution. I mean, then, then we did do a series of, of uh, public meetings uh, collaborating with some faith-based organizations and, and, and then we got a chance to show people these maps and talk about it. And, and so I, mean, I think that that kind of model allows us as technologists, as researchers to be able to kind of understand what's going on in a community through uh, these, new, these new data sources but, um, and, to, and to apply some, some advanced mapping and analysis, but then to really show them and say, it does this paint the reality that, that you're experiencing. Yeah, to that point of kind of comparing a data set that's been collected or uh, you know an analysis that's been run with the lived experiences of the people who are kind of implicated in that, um, that data set, that is a topic that we actually you know, had some early phase dis discussions with the, the city would we cre collect so much data and we, we also, you know, make a lot of data public. Should we be including with the metadata of a um, data set, like some actual voices from people in the community of how they reacted when they were presented with that data set? That would be a super interesting, I think, approach to take um, if we invested the, you know, time and energy that it would take to you know, educate communities and community members about the data sets that we were collecting, which it, it's not a, like a light lift, right? Like not everybody has the ability to read a GIS set or to, you know, understand a, a complex data analysis um, if it's not, you know, their core competency or what they spend their days doing. Um, you know, I think we even struggle with that sometimes with novel data sets, but if you really invest that time and are able to get a reaction, like, then you have a really rich insight. Um, and is that something that we should just include in the metadata um, for new data sets that are collected for planning and design processes going forward? Uh, I think that would be super, super interesting to do and have kind of like community voices as part of the, just the download set. I love that idea. That's great. So, please, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, please keep the questions coming in the, in the chat. Yeah, so, no, I had a question. Martin? Go ahead. Yeah, I was really interested. I was, um, you know, sort of it occurred to me, Niley, when you sort of said um, that the people who took the heat sensors out into the city will never forget that experience. And I thought, oh, that's absolutely right. Because what you did was you changed the, you know, we are taking data from you to you are collecting the data. And it's sort of the same thing, I have to say, quite profoundly, um, in which the cell phones have now sort of raised a really you know serious issue about police brutality and the filming of all of those of course are now part of the national dialogue and have um you know perhaps increased accountability or at least um you know pointed the finger towards these you know terrible terrible things so i think there's something really sort of profound about the sort of um giving agency to people to collect data and that's why also i really like your lunchbox sort of idea that you're bringing it home, you're using it in your environment. Mm -hmm. And it sort of led me to think about uh, people recording, you know, airplane noises in their neighborhoods or traffic noises that are excessive and how you could turn the collection of data into an advocacy position. 
Yeah, I'm super interested in that. That's why I'm so excited about that program. I think you're you're totally right. It, it serves this other purpose beyond the actual data that you're that you're collecting. You're embedding the concept of data collection into the community, which is so important to have that cultural shift towards more data consciousness and awareness of that of all these invisible systems at play. Another um, interesting correlation that we observed in that lunchbox um, training set, what, or not the training set, the, the trial set that we did, was that um, in certain areas that are underneath the flight path, noise level is also correlated to air quality. And that makes total sense, right? An airplane, mm -hmm. go, you know, if, if there's airplanes constantly going over, um, you can, uh, you know, obviously observe that the air quality is gonna be going down. And then when COVID happened and the number of planes went down, you know, obviously the training set is not observing planes literally, but it is measuring air, you know, um, noise levels. And so the noise level went down and so did the air quality uh, or the air quality went way up. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of thing that makes the data more personal, right? Like people observe that there's less noise because there's no planes going over. Then how can we make that really personal and draw their attention to this other issue that is invisible, but we want them to take action on um, around air quality. So um, I had another question just around, you know, kind of the, the business of data, obviously, you know, data is like gold now and everyone, you know, um, is, is interested in, in, in mining it and kind of, um, you, you know, using it to um, inform advertising or, or you know, what, what, whatever else is the, the, their business model is. Um, so I was, I was kind of curious, um, you know, it's also, there's an expense to, to actually gathering the data, right? Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit more from both of you just around, uh, you know, what, what do you think about those partnerships in terms of, and I'd be curious to hear like specifically around Numina too, I don't know what their business model is, but, um, you know, for most of these folks who have sensors out, um, you know, the idea is that they, they can cover the expense of putting all those sensors out by being able to, you know, um, gather that data and kind of keep it private and use it to inform decisions at, at whatever level. Um, but if you are able to make the data public and it's just, you know, um, what, what, what is the business model there? Um, well, it, it varies from vendor to vendor widely. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually why we're trying to develop a better set of standards and actually even internal training for our city of Boston employees, because it's not in very many people's job description to be an expert on different data privacy and data collection practices. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people unknowingly are actually in the position of arbitrating these relationships between, you know, the, the, the public sector and these private data collection, um, you know, and, and data technology vendors. And, and they're not equipped with the, um, you know, awareness of all of these different issues that are at play. Like you mentioned, they're not necessarily in a position to say that one business model is more, you know, um, transparent and supportive mm -hmm. of the city's goals than another. And nor should they be, right? If you are a transportation planner, and you're an expert in that field and not necessarily in data transparency, you know, it, we have to bring people along for that. So that's a long way of getting to answer your question, which is um, that in the case of Numina specifically, the city, they, they don't offer those sensors for free. We have to pay for them. So that's their business model there. You're right that a lot of sensors, the technology is, or the hardware is basically provided for free. The data collection is like a free service and you pay for it because that data set is sold to, um, you know, third parties um, for mm -hmm. commercialization. I would prefer personally that we move away from working with that type of vendor. It's not always possible because not every vendor has a business model that we love. Um, I think then the conversation shifts to, well, what kind of leverage can we exert as the city um, to try to get a better, better terms in the arrangement or try mm -hmm. to advocate for, you know, where we would like to see them go. And what is our responsibility to the residents in that point, at that point, in terms of alerting them that a data collection is taking place, um, or like that a vendor is not a hundred percent where we would want them to be, but we still need the data because it's essential to some sort of planning or operations purpose. Right. Um, I think like in the spectrum of business models, you have, um, you know, when you, when you pay uh, for the hardware and you, you kind of like pay an upfront fee, maybe it's a little bit elevated to, you know, what other companies might be. Um, but the transparency, access and privacy is like rock solid. Um, and you basically pay for that on the front end. 
you have that model where it's cheaper or free, but the data is resold. Um, and then you also have kind of these freemium models um, where it's something in between and you pay for a limited access, um, either the amount of time that you have access or the, um, the resolution of the data is limited and, unless you pay more. Um, I am of the opinion that increasingly, if you are a sensor and you're attached to city infrastructure, mm -hmm. that that data should belong to the residents because we pay for that, that light pole or we pay for that sidewalk we should have access to the data that's collected on that infrastructure. Of course, that doesn't get even close to the question of cell phone data, which is increasingly becoming what people rely on. I, I think um, more and more we see our, our city contractors or subcontractors working with private data analytics firms that draw on cell phone locational data to tell us about traffic flows or pedestrian patterns and stuff. And you know, unlike a sensor that lives physically on a light pole, there's no way to tell people, you know, your data has just been collected because your cell phone is, has an SDK embedded in it and it's telling us where you are. Um, people should know that, but we don't necessarily always have like a channel to let them know. Um, those are the, that's the business model that I, I like the least, but I also have the least response to because we're not really in a position to push back on that use. I don't know, Justin, I'd be curious to hear what you think about those different business models as well. Oh, but you are gone. <laughs> Justin's still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here, sorry. But Justin's trying to avoid the collection <laughs> of his visually identifiable data. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. You. So Justin, we'd be just curious to hear your your take on kind of who, who owns the data and um, in terms of you know different business models for collecting it. And I'd be curious to hear on the academic side too, like about different partnerships and um, you know what access you have to to data. Yeah. So what's um, what's really interesting is that there are a few of these big tech companies that are making their data available for non-commercial use for research or um, other types of investigations. So, so that includes Twitter, which I mentioned, and Flickr, um, and um, Google through the uh, Street View a API. Um, but like, if you want to try to access like Facebook stream or Instagram, um, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and, and in a lot of like the, um, kind of like more like global systems, um, Weibo and like the stuff out of Asia. I mean, none of that stuff is, is easily accessible. So, you know, they've essentially just closed the door. And in many ways you have to wonder when all these other ones are gonna close the door. But for now, I think they see enough value in it being used um, for research purposes that they uh, continue to, to, to make this, make it as, a, as an option. Um, oh, I would mention one other thing actually about that that is interesting is that a lot of um, the private companies that we work with to get data, they always have added services basically or professional services that you can add on for a free where they'll take the data that you're paying for and then they'll give you like a customized report or some, you know, level of additional analysis on top of that. And I have found that um, in general, not universally, but in general, those customized or added services tend to be not so useful because it's again, this approach that's just taking an automated um, kind of like uh, non-human centered approach to looking at the numbers. And so a lot of times the insights that they'll come back to us with are not insightful at all. They're just pointing yeah. to, you know, trends <laughs> that are either easily observable or, you know, observable with a, a, a little bit of additional work. And so I get really frustrated when people say like, oh, we can give you real time insights or we can and we'll, and we'll charge you extra to give you these customized reports. And I, I often respond, you know, what is that insight going to let me do differently yeah. uh, than I currently do? And usually the answer is nothing at all. Yeah, I really, I really like your example of the Big Betty trash can. I, I heard a, a story, which I'm, I'm sure a number of folks are familiar with, around like the um, the kind of bus optimization. So there was some really sophisticated algorithms used to optim optimize the bus schedules around Boston, um, but it became like 
it, it was, you know, it was mathematically a very, very successful model, but in, in terms of implementation, it, it, it was, um, you know, a little bit of a disaster and just in terms of, you know, they, they, because they didn't focus enough on the, the kind of human side of it, right? Every, everything was just a number to them. And so um, even though they, you know, were potentially making a really positive impact in terms of taking a lot of buses off the road, it, it wasn't successful because, you know, because these are people and, and obviously, um, uh, you know, they didn't do enough to, um, to uh, get the communities on, on board. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, on, on, that, on that side of things, because I think increasingly as we're kind of using computers to help with the decision-making around data, um, the, I think there's a little bit of um, mistrust in terms of um, the ability of the com computers to really look out for individuals or people. So just be curious to hear your take on that. Uh, just say that last part again. The so uh, yeah, just well, when 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 we're starting to use you know computers and 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 modeling as part of like a very significant like almost letting the computers decide on things that impact people's lives, you know, for example, in this case, rewriting a bus to go a different route because it's more efficient because you've kind of set the criteria in terms of like the the models and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, in terms of how we get people to trust in that process, if it's not an, another person making the decision, but it's, you know, you're trying to do it in the way that you're getting um, computers to really use the data and, and, and make some of the decisions. Actually, Nayeli, can I answer this one? Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> Justin, go for it. I actually, I, after hearing it the second time, I actually had a good, uh, a good answer. Um, so it was a great honor. I got invited to speak at the Yale School of Architecture. They did like a big public lecture. My mom came and a big, big deal. And, um, and I talked about the uh, cognitive architecture research, the biometric stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they were not happy with me. Um, so like after I gave my presentation, Alan Plattis, which some of you may know him, he stood up and he's like, what are you going to make these, these computers just going to design cities for us? <laughs> you no, know, that, that, that was the gut reaction. If you can just put it all in an algorithm, I'm like, well, what are we going to do <laughs> as poor architects? Well, you know, put mm -hmm. us out of work. And um, so I think it was just like a complete misunderstanding. Um, and I, and I, I think that, that that's my answer to your question, which is it, 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 these are all tools. They're all tools mm -hmm. to help us as, as humans, as whether you're a planner or you're architect, um, to, to be able to um, make decisions. So, it's, so it just gives us another insight. And that's why I started my presentation with the existing uh, tools and data sources that we have. And we're not throwing those in the garbage. Um, so it's, it's about just having an, a, like a new set of tools to be able to um, access different types of data to, to help make decisions. So I'm not, put, not putting anyone out of work here. <laughs> Nelly, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I've just been thinking about it. I think um, people shouldn't trust a, a process that was entirely driven and determined by a computer. I wouldn't trust mm -hmm. that process and I wouldn't suggest <laughs> that anybody else would. Um, I think, I mean, you have to have both. These are yeah. tools, like Justin said, that can help you. I think they can accelerate the process of bringing scenarios to the public. Um, they can help to anticipate things that then need to be kind of ground test or ground truthed um, and, mm -hmm. and stress tested by observing real human behavior. Um, and I think no matter how good your computer model is, there's always something in the real world that's gonna break it. And we've seen that time and mm -hmm. time again. Um, so I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. I wouldn't advocate for people to have kind of blind, blind trust in these systems, especially when it comes to planning and design. Like we've seen the, um, the shortcomings of a technocratic approach to urban planning, you know, time and time again, this is only, you know, um, going further along that, that path. I think it's a positive development in the field of urban planning and design that we're becoming more human focused. Um, and I, I wouldn't suggest that people try to move away from that through, by relying too heavily on models. Yeah. But I get what you're saying. You want people to understand that your approach, which is based in data, 
is valid. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, a, and that, it's that's objective. Like I think that's, that's like that yeah. cultural shift that we keep coming back to of like, you have to bring people along the process into the process of collecting and analyzing data. Mm -hmm. You have to build that mm -hmm. consciousness in the population, which takes time. So people don't really like to try to do it. Um, but once people, imagine project ourselves into the future when just everybody has a better sense of what data is and how it's collected mm -hmm. and maybe even a general sense of you know how it impacts their lives then we'll have kind of that baseline um trust in these models and then you can have mm -hmm. a more evolved conversation with the public but right now they're existing totally separately and there's just like just such a imbalance in access to the knowledge and information you're, you're never going to hundred percent get there. Yeah. I think as you're saying, so much of it comes down to, to trust, right? Um, and I think if, even if there's a sense that some of these models can be more objective than a, than a, than a person would if they were making the, the decision. I can give you um, a real world example of this exact yeah. dynamic that we're facing in Boston right now, right? So, I mean, some people, I, I hope I'm not getting myself into, you know, too much of a controversial territory, but some people really feel that the um, cause of congestion in Boston is a lack of parking. And some people really feel that Boston would be better served by removing parking spaces and making space for active transportation and you know, open green space and green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think reasonable people can disagree. We've done data collection to try to um, you know, measure or evaluate this, this debate quantitatively. And if you tell people in Boston that there is available parking at any time in the neighborhood <laughs> where they're trying to park, you know, whether or not you have a data point to try to disapprove that, they will tell you it takes 40 minutes to find a parking space downtown. That might be true. It might not be true. Truth is probably somewhere in the middle, but the data is never going to convince them that they didn't spend 40 minutes trying to find a parking space. Mm -hmm. So then where do you go, right? There's no, there's no room for the data, as the model in that conversation. Yeah. You have to convince people on a value basis, I think. Nayeli, you brought up a, a really interesting point that I wanted to see if this could tie in. Uh, this, this notion of business models that we're talking about, who owns the data, um, your reluctance to, one's reluctance to give data, et cetera. I think we all know that when we get apps and we pay money for it, that we're, we're buying something. And when mm -hmm. we get free apps, uh, we're the product, right? <laughs> They're buying us in a sense. So I've been struggling to try to think about it in the public realm, uh, how is it that, um, that one might be more, uh, willing to give data. In other words, when we sign up for things and it says, uh, read these user agreements and accept, I don't know how many people uh, read through it and accept, people just accept because they want to. It's convenient for them and they want this thing. So I wonder like with regard to parking, as you mentioned, if the, if the problem to solve was people want to come to the city and be able to park quickly closest to where they're going, if, if the trade-off is great, we need your data. We need to know where you are. We need to know where empty spots are maybe we need to know where you want to go, you know, and things like that. And if one was to say, great, I, I sign in on this and therefore the convenience I get is a quick parking spot. Uh, how, right. how would you, maybe, maybe that's what you're, you're talking about when, when you talk about operationalizing data, you know, I think how, how would you get the public behind such an idea to be able to give data willingly for that convenience? Well, we tried the exact approach that you are talking about, and a lot of other cities have had that um, as well. I think it's very hard to, and our systems aren't quite there yet to do that in real time. I think in some cities where they have very regular parking spots and more parking lots, that's a little bit more easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we have tried a couple of uh, experiments in that, the use technology like you're describing. Boston, has really irregular parking, to be honest. A lot of it's curbside and it's not regular spaces. So it's quite hard to tell people where there's a space. Um, that's, that's sort of in the weeds, but that's one of the reasons why that technology is not a great fit. Um, but it's also really hard to empower real-time decision-making um, reliably. And I think the answer to your question of how do you get people to make that trade is again, goes back to trust. If you can really trust that it's gonna have a measurable and positive impact on your life, you're gonna make that trade, but very quickly, people abandon those solutions, at least in the ones that we have tried, because the trade-off wasn't measurable and positive. It was kind of nothing. Um, and it was very hard to scale and operationalize. So it didn't work out. Should the technology improve, 
maybe that trust goes up and then people's adoption will also go up. I mean, mm -hmm. just look at all the technologies that we have adopted um, at scale. It's because we really love the product um, mm -hmm. and, or, or there's no option. In the case of parking, we, we might get there actually, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're pretty much at time. We have one, one last question, um, which I'll have a minute or two to, to answer. Um, so Tim is asking uh, whether positive uses of gamification can provide ways to engage uh, the particip participatory relationship between data and real experiences of, of people. Um, so yeah. Well, one... actually I put an answer in the chat, but. Oh, you did. <laughs> but I'm happy to elaborate. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Eric Gordon um, is uh, visiting at MIT right now. He's a professor at Emerson, and he's done this uh, engagement games lab. And he's actually partnered quite a lot with the uh, mayor's office of new urban mechanics. And so, yeah, they, they've had a, a lot of success. Um, myself, I've done a few projects. Um, we've done some stuff like in Second Life, you know, different types of virtual environments. And um, yeah, I definitely think that that's the answer. And it's connected to some of the stuff I was talking about with um, the, the biometrics where it's kind of like, if it's, if it's like unconscious or, or the uh, social media stuff where it's unobtrusive, it's like, once you, once you kind of grab someone in the street and say, you know, where, where do you think the park should be? I mean, you, you, you really lose any chance of getting any kind of valid response. There's just so much social desirability bias. There's so much um, that you have to really worry about in terms of getting, getting really the answer. So if you can try to take down their guard and instead it's, it's a game, they're just playing. And of course they'll tell you where the park should be because they want to get points. Um, so right. okay. Nayeli, do you want to jump on? Yeah, obviously Eric Gordon's engagement lab has had a lot of um, done a lot of work with Monum over the years. I definitely believe in the um, the potential of gamification in some aspects. I think it's you you have to be really careful about how it's it's sort of like data in general. You have to be careful about how you message it. If you tell people it's a game but it's serious, that's not good. If you tell people it's serious <laughs> but it's just a game, that's not good either. Um, so I think in 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 the right context, gamification can be great um, and can definitely draw in a different audience. Also, I think um, gamification gets people in the mindset of um, having fun and they're always gonna be, I think, more invested in a process that's fun and enjoyable than one that's tedious and painful. Um, so yeah, I'm all for it in the right, in the right context. Great, well, thank you so much everyone for coming. That was a really, really um, great uh, conversation and really appreciate both your presentations too. Um, yeah, if, is anything else we should mention, Rami or, or Martin? No, I, I, I think that's pretty good. I, I was just sort of, you know, pondering um, what, what uh, Rami had written in the description about William White and thinking about that, you know, <laughs> pregenitor to data collection in public spaces and that we go back to and what the lessons learned there and how far we've come <laughs> with all of that. Um, even though it also just made me think of the, um, plastic chairs in South Boston for saving parking spaces. So, you know, there's no tech <laughs> options as well. You're right. So I'd just like to say uh, on behalf of, of me and Ken anyways, uh, co-joining co with uh, the Urban Design Committee, uh, with Martin and Rami especially has just been great. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and both, you know, Justin and Nayeli and, and the uh, speakers that we had last time, uh, I'd like to just continue this. I think it's a great mashup, yeah. but I'm sure we'll, we'll collaborate again but I want to invite everybody here uh, to experience both of our, our groups, you know, separately and at times together. I think there's just a lot of overlap. Uh, one thing I'll mention about Ken and my group is that um, we have co cohorts that meet, um, you know, in between monthly meetings. We have a virtual reality cohort. So if you're interested in this kind of uh, um, experimentation, especially with newer technologies, um, the doors are open for that cohort right now and doing some fun things. And, and maybe at some point, uh, Justin, you can uh, peek in uh, since you're doing some work in Second Life and, and see what that's about. So yeah, happy to, happy to meet you and Nayeli and, and look forward to future collaboration. And uh, thanks for all for joining us. I don't want to be the last word here, but I just want to thanks be grateful. For thanks for joining us. It's been great. Thanks. It's great. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Great. Take care.
See you guys. Michael, um, reach out to you if I want to uh, sit in on the uh, virtual reality cohort. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, both my and, and Ken's email address are on the uh, BSA Design Visualization Knowledge Community page. Okay. Architects.org. Um, I will do that. Um, I have no direct experience in VR, but um, I'm sucking up everything I can like a sponge over the next three months. Excellent. So, Do you have access to, um, to uh, goggles? I do not. Okay. That, that would be the, the key part, although we do have uh, some software that you can uh, you can get into the space on a desktop, but obviously it's much more um, immersive if you're in the space in v VR. The, the prices for, um, for hardware has come down tremendously. There's uh, Oculus Quest, which is um, a standalone headset that doesn't need to be plugged into a computer. Okay. Uh, and that's um, become very reasonable through uh, the acquisition of Facebook. Excellent. I will take a look at that and send you an email and see you at the cohort, I guess. Perfect. Thank All you. right. Have a good evening. You too. Take care. Leo. All right. All right. I am out of here.